world is a foreigner. I mean, even Iran in a way <laughs> was a foreigner means you somebody from outside. I am always a photographer from outside, going to a situation, taking photographs and going home. I never become the other. Wherever I photograph, if it's a war, if it's a revolution, if it's a, some religion, I always go back to my own place, to my own culture. He has observed, interpreted, photographed, and described the realities he witnesses in a direct, extremely personal style, not only as he sees, but also how he wants to convey them to others. Abbas, a born photographer, as his biography state, is Iranian, living and traveling in a world of conflict, oppression, faith, and fanaticism. From Islam to Catholicism to Hinduism, posing questions and reflecting on the historical implications, but above all, man, in his most intimate moments. Well, you know, we're in the Hindu temple in Paris. And by the way, you realize how convivial it is. It's not like a Catholic mass. People move around and um, they give you lunch at the end. So you might think, you know, might ask, what's the link between what I'm doing here today and the Iranian revolution? I mean, it's really the Iranian revolution which made me interested in religions because I could see the passion raised by the um, revolution in Iran. Then, of course, I got interested in Islam, Christianity, paganism, Buddhism, and now I'm doing uh, Hinduism. So that's why I'm in this temple. I'm fascinated by religion because I don't understand why people believe. I still don't understand. And maybe they understand then. I can define why people need God, but why people believe, I still don't know. When I started my work on the resurgence of Islam and Islamism, it became very obvious at the beginning there were two elements. One was Islam, the religion, the faith, people's relation with God, which was not my problem. On Islamism, the political side, the ideology, it was totally different. They're telling you what to do, you know, and what you should think. So, this is Islam. This is a man praying in Indonesia, He's gone, it's a very nice picture, he's with God, you know. This is Islamism. It's a demonstration in Paris in favor of the whale. And you can see the, the violence inside the photograph. So I tried to, again, I tried to be fair to my subject and I didn't try to show only the Islamism, the ideology, but also Islam because Islamism doesn't grow in the void. Islamism grows on Islam. 
So I had to show the relation between the two. And I did the same with Christians, I did the same with every other religion. The year is 1979. Ayatollah Khomeini, after a period of exile imposed by the Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, returns to Iran. His ideals are the inspiration behind the demonstrations that have been taking place for over a year against the Shah, who had paralyzed the country for decades, investing huge amounts of capital in building the army and financing his own monarchy. Khomeini will soon take over, founding the Iranian Republic and implementing a rigid Islamic and anti-Western policy. was my country, my people, and my revolution, at least in the early stages, when the revolution was a national movement, before it was confiscated by the mullahs, by the religious element. So I went back to Iran in 1977, when I knew something would happen, because the country was developing too fast, there were too many tensions. So I wanted to do some in-depth work on Iran, but then suddenly the revolution happens. So all I had to do was to go down in the streets and take photographs, because it was all happening in the streets. My own interpretation is that the people were taking revenge on the Shah, because the Shah with his regime, with the political police, the uh, Savak, had humiliated every Iranian. Everybody thought that every other Iranian was a Savaki, a secret agent. People would not even talk to their brothers or their cousins because they were afraid of the Savak. You know. That suddenly people perceived that the Shah is weak, the regime cannot control them, the Savak is <laughs> no, he's not there. So they emboldened and they started the revolution. And so, as I said, you know, it was a revolt and it became a revolution. When the American embassy was taken up by the militants, I was in Paris. So I thought maybe the thing will be over within a day because Iranian militants had taken the American embassy before and I was there. It was, and it was, you know, it was settled in a few hours. During those years, Abbas follows the dynamics in his country and the uprisings that trigger this radical change. But his sense of belonging does not divert his eye, and he recounts every detail with a totally objective and critical spirit. It's the same approach that had already characterized his previous photo features on Vietnam and South Africa. Vietnam was very important for my generation because it was really the world event. But when I became an international photographer, it was too late. The big battles were over. So what I did, I tried to do something different. I tried to go to the Viet Cong because people had been to North Vietnam, people had been to South Vietnam, but nobody had been really been to the Viet Cong, which were fighting in the South. Or if they went in, it was just, you know, they were militants, but not real photojournalists. So I thought the best, the best way to show this war was to go to the other side. So when the peace process started in Paris, and Kissinger was negotiating with the North Vietnamese, Le Duc Thau, and Kissinger made the statement, peace is at hand, I just jumped on the first plane. Because when there is a ceasefire, I knew from experience that this is the best time to work. Because the states are weak, there's less control, then you can work. So I went in a couple of times, and I spent like a week with them. And they were very, very, very fruitful week. It was like, you know, probably in those days, the most eventful week of my life because we were moving around Viet Cong all the time. After I did that, I also went to North Vietnam. So I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think I'm the only photographer who's covered three different sides of Vietnam. The South, the North, and the Viet Cong. Wars are very complex because there is a social element, the economic element, the psychic element, you know, even sometimes spiritual element in the, in the wars. So as a photographer, I always try to cover all these various aspects of a war. 
Battle is just one thing, the violence, the direct violence, you know, two troops or two sides fighting, it's just one part of it. When you see a Viet Cong resting with his gun next to him, with his Kalashnikov next to him, it looks like a very sort of relaxing moment, intimate moment, but it's not, the war is still on. South Africa was very important in my life because there was apartheid, and I was obviously was not in favor of apartheid. So I get there on the first day, of course, I go to the Ministry of Information, they welcome me and they say, oh, Mr. Abbas, we have a school for um, policemen trainees. Do you want to photograph it? And I say, oh, this is propaganda. They want me, to, you know, it's something they're proud of and they want me to. I was just about to say, no, thanks, you know. Then I said, okay. So they take me to the school of uh, policemen and they're all naked to the waist and they're all running and, you know, and I see the colonel, of course, they're all black. You know, and the colonel who runs the school is white. So they all stop, you know, and the colonel stands in front of them. I, I make a formal portrait. And you can see there's a lot of tension. And this photograph became an icon of apartheid. I mean, each time somebody wanted to um, illustrate apartheid, you know, they would have this white colonel, you know, in front of the blacks lined up. The Iranian Revolution is not merely a personal matter for Abbas. It offers him the opportunity to clearly express his style, thoughts, and views of the situation. The series of photographs taken during those years will provide the basis for the future, producing shots that will become true icons of photojournalism. And I remember very vividly, I mean, this is, this is the situation. You can see a woman being lynched by demonstrators who then went to become revolutionaries. So there was a pro-Shah demonstration and this woman was believed to be pro-Shah, so people are lynching her, you know, they're hitting her and they're dragging her. In these moments of um, action, you don't think, you just shoot. And of course, somebody would shout always, oh, don't take photographs, don't take photographs. And I would say, okay, this is for history. I would say it in Farsi. But the problem was not taking the photograph, the problem was showing it. Because in the evening, we'd get together with friends, we'd talk about my day's events, and my friends said, uh, Abbas, you shouldn't publish this photograph because it shows the revolution in the wrong, wrong way. You know, it's uh, suddenly, it's not, the violence is not from the regime, from the Shah's regime, it's also from us. So I said, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I might be for the revolution at this stage, but I'm also a journalist, I'm a historian of the present, so my picture has to be seen now. Taking of the hostages, the American hostages, in the American embassy was a turning point because that's how we could see the revolution was being confiscated slowly. People will come in front of the embassy, they will demonstrate, and it went on, it went on, and it went on. At one point, even it was like a media event, and there was a Japanese film producer. He would say, okay, go on now. And they would say, whoa, 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 whoa death to America, death to America. And they'd say, okay, stop, and they would stop. It was Hollywood. And then afterwards, you know, then the Americans, journalists will come to me and say, Abbas, please, something I don't understand, you know. Uh, they, they, they sing death to America, death to America, and then when it's finished, they come and invite me for tea. So the turning point when the revolution started being confiscated slowly was the American hostages. In fact, it was not 50 and then 42 
American diplomats were hostage. It was the whole Iranian nation which was hostage of Khomeini on his clique. In those days, I was shooting analog. I mean, I was shooting film. So therefore, the second stage after shooting was the contact sheets. But they're also important for another reason, because they capture events, which sometimes you, know, you don't have the time to see. I remember very vividly when Khomeini came back from Paris and he walked down the steps of the plane and up to then, Khomeini was the nice old man, a sort of Gandhi. But then, 25 years later, I discover a, a gem, you know, and this is Khomeini's face. So, it's only one frame, in you know, a many frame. And his face is no longer the face of the nice, gentle old man sitting in, under the apple tree. Suddenly, he's Khome the Khomeini he would become later. His eyes are so sharp and he's looking down at all the, um, like the uh, lay people, not the religious people, and his eyes are saying, wait until my feet hit the ground and then you will see. The attack on the U.S. Embassy in November 1979 is the key event of the revolutionary uprisings. After the United States refuses to extradite the Shah, who is there for medical treatment, Iranian students swarm the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, occupying it and taking 50 hostages. Almost two years will pass before they are released. So just stay there. On that day, if I look at my contact sheets now, I can see that, you know, there were so many, it was, you know, it was media event because you have some important character and personality from the regime because he has bodyguards coming, but you can see also people selling food, you know, like a, <laughs> like a fair. And you can see the, the journalists, you can see the, all the journalists, you know, working. And I'm surprised when I look at my contact sheets now, I see I just shot two frames. And then one is obviously is the good one. And then I go photograph the um, journalist at work, TV crews. And then I come back, the last frame again is the, these two armed militants um, shouting in front of the element. And again, you know, photography sometimes, um, you photograph something you're not aware of. It's only when you look at the contact sheet or when you look at your prints that you see it. There's a very, element, you know, there is uh, something in the, uh, the, at the end of the picture, you can see the Statue of Liberty raising its hand the same way that the militants are, you know, this is history uh, giving you a little wink, you know, that's what it is. I don't provide answers, I help people to define questions. I ask the questions, but the answers are multiple. I mean, sometimes I give my own answers in the text or even in the sequence of photographs, you see. Again, this is why a sequence is important. I mean, the sequence really is your, is your writing. It's, um, your photography is not just one frame, it's just the whole thing. See, there are three times in photography. The first one is shooting. And this moment is emotional. I mean, you... But if you take this frame instead of that one, it's not by chance. It's defined by your culture, by your education, by your personality, by um, the fight you had with your girlfriend the night before, your emotions you felt, you know, all these things feed you. But you're not thinking, you just do it, you just take it, auto, you know, almost automatically, you take this photograph, although they're fed. So the second part is the editing, which, you know, we will see. So when you edit, you choose for that. Then the third part, which is probably the most important one, is the sequencing. He 
because taking the same photograph, putting it in different order, might mean something totally different. So that's why when I'm doing a book with a publisher, I insist, you know, they, they, their responsibility is the cover, the title, they have the last word. But I have the last word on the uh, sequence. My photography didn't change. I mean, I like to say I've been taking the same picture for 50 years. Same photograph means the same style. I mean, if you look at my photographs, what I like about them is the suspended moment. Suspended moment means I, I like to give the feeling that when I took the photograph, the people who were doing what they were, they were doing kept on doing the same thing. They didn't stop for me. They went, it wasn't a frozen moment. It was a suspended moment. That's my way of... And also, if you look at my photographs, I mean, think there are many elements. My best photograph, there are many things happening at the same time. You know, there's something there, something there, something there, but there is a kind of harmony between what's happening. And this is what I call the suspended moment. Mexico was important because after the... I mean, covering the revolution for two years had really drained me out emotionally because they'd given really a, a lot. So I could see that the wave of Islamism raised by the Iranian revolution was not going to stop at the borders of Iran. It was going to hit the whole of the Muslim world and maybe the rest of the world. Emotionally, I wasn't ready, you know, because as I said, I was drained. So for three years, I went to a country I knew from before because I had lived there one year, Mexico. And then Mexico helped me to define my style because not contrary to Iran, what all you had to do was to come on the streets. Everything was happening in the street. In Mexico, nothing was happening. There was no event. So I went to Mexico, I did, I think, 12 trips within three years, in and out. And um, then, you know, I did two books and it helped me define my aesthetics and my style of photography and become more intellectual. This is Magnum. These were um, stamps to put either on prints or on dupes, color dupes. And of course, we don't distribute prints except for exhibitions and we don't distribute dupes. Everything is electronic now. But it's very moving to see all these people who found the founders of Magnum first. First, Kappa, Robert Kappa, Robert Kappa, Henri Cartier-Bresson, George Roger. Now, where is Chim? Sorry, Chim is missing. But then we have people who, who left us, who died. You know, like, uh, of course, the two Kappa brothers, um, Henri, Roger, Silverstone. You know. But the good thing is we have some new names but without the latest one, because the latest one don't use film, you know. So um, we have some younger guy, Ben Dixon, and we have, um, who else? South, Alex South. You know, it's, it can be nostalgic about this, but... The other thing we have as well, which, you know, which disappeared is, are these, you know, the... <coughs> I mean, in a way, this is all my, my life, and there's more behind there, you know, all my contact sheets. And the last one is number, <coughs> uh, number 152. Book number 100, I have 152 books. That's the last one there. We had contact sheets, but that's how they were. They were kept. And so this is it. This is the end of this world, the analog world. <laughs>